Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the day eight of uh, DHS2 Analytics Tools Level 1 Academy. Um, so now we are kind of uh, closing towards the end of our academy. We are now on to the day eight, and we just have two more days. Uh, uh, and in these two, two days, uh, we'll be mostly uh, doing the comprehensive exercise and the uh, final exam. So in that sense, today will be the uh, final day uh, that we'll be covering content related to the analytic tools. So I hope that uh, you have learned a lot during this um, seven days so far. And in fact, uh, today is going to be, an, uh, be the day that uh, you will have the um, most amount of engagement with the facilitators and peers, uh, because we have, we have gone through the reviews uh, and identified few a few points that you have been constantly highlighting. So one of them is um, sometimes that you feel that uh, there is lack of engagement with the um, uh, peers, like uh, fellow participants, as well as uh, facilitators sometimes. Um, we, we agree that, uh, I mean, in fact, like um, uh, if any of you have attended our on-site academies, uh, we, we tend to find that uh, those are more engaging. But uh, unfortunately in this, uh, because we have to just use the online method uh, of conducting these academies. And uh, there are some uh, inherent um, limitations uh, when it comes to engagement with uh, other participants due to technology as well. And also we are somewhat constrained with time. Uh, in fact, like I was uh, mentioning to you, I think on day two or three, that uh, we will try to uh, like even um, uh, bring you more content on the two locations that, uh, that we, I mean, the, the two, two countries who are um, conducting this academy in Sri Lanka and India, and we'll have some couple of virtual tours. But also there was some uh, uh, feedback uh, from you coming that, uh, I mean, mentioning that uh, most of you find it difficult if we exceed uh, three hours time uh, in a given day. So we had to really um, concentrate more on covering the content and uh, give you as much as possible time to cover the uh, exercise as well. So that's why we could not, in fact, uh, have even that kind of engaging activities we sometimes do. Uh, so apologies for that. Right, um, so today what we hope to cover, like there are two main topics. First thing is uh, about interpretations and the data to action framework. Uh, and in fact, like what we will be doing is we will, we will introduce you what this data to action framework is and how to write interpretations uh, in the DHS2 platform. And then we will have a group activity where you all, uh, all of you will be, um, divided into eight groups. Uh, so there'll be around uh, uh, four to five members per group. And you, we give you a small assignment uh, where you have to discuss within the group and uh, uh, make a one slide presentation. And uh, a volunteer, uh, a person who can volunteer from the group uh, is supposed to present uh, what you have discussed in the group within like two to three minutes uh, time. So. Um, we can have a small uh, discussion, like all of us can contribute, even the facilitators, uh, and we hope to have eight presentations. So that is why we really have to uh, stick to the time. So that's the first part. And then the second is going to be about uh, implementation considerations uh, in implementing uh, analytic tools in your DHS2 instance. So today, like the, the two topics that we'll be discussing is kind of advanced, like you need some background knowledge about DHS2 as well as a domain. Uh, domain in the sense, like for, especially for the interpretations, it's about uh, more of the domain expertise on health. Whereas for implementation considerations, you might need some background on um, ICT as well uh, to understand fully. But we will try our best uh, so that, like uh, all of, I mean, uh, so that um, we, we can make it as simplified as possible. So uh, none of you will um, find it difficult to um, grasp what we are trying to present. So that's the plan for today. So uh, I think we have decent number of participants to start. So uh, let's start the session, um, the, the first session on data to action framework. Right, so the learning objectives uh, for this first session is to understand the rationale of using data to action framework and the components uh, that we have in the data to action framework. And then, uh, to develop a data to action framework by yourself. So ideally at the end of uh, this session, you should be able to uh, design a data to action framework by yourself. And then we will try to add data to action frameworks to uh, existing DHS2 visualizations, right? Okay, so that's the plan for today. 
so the initial session is going uh, initial half of this session is going to be a presentation and i will be demonstrating and then you will have time uh, to engage uh, with others and uh, design your data to action frame right so first uh, we have a, a image a photo here so i give you the chance um, to comment on what you see on this uh, particular photo like uh, why do we put this kind of a photo in DHIS2 presentation? Uh, what do you think about it? I mean, when you look at this photo, uh, what can you say about it? Any guesses? What is this photo about? What is the significance? What can you say about it? Anything? Uh, free free talk or need to group discussion uh pamut uh sorry i could not get you channel uh, free talk or need to group discussion no uh, you you're free to talk yes please please tell me like what, what do you like see in this photo anything significant uh, i guess uh, it is um um mean that um the passenger uh, the driver need to ask the passenger where to go um uh, which location uh, which direction to go okay great yeah because like the driver is looking uh, backwards and we assume that the passenger is there on the back seat so he's uh, maybe like he's talking to the uh, passenger and disguise about the directions or something like that right um anybody else who want to contribute like also look around uh, and i mean see what is there in the background and everything so background really matters uh, it seems like she is driving the car, but she is talking to the passenger behind her. All right. So she's while driving the forward. car, she is talking. Okay. Yeah. She is not, not focusing practice. on the road. She is not looking at uh, what is ahead of her. She is hmm. just talking to the passenger. Yeah. Kind of a dangerous thing that she is doing. Any other answers? I think she is looking at something. She is trying to look for something. She's trying to look for something where uh, maybe the one who's taking the photo or somewhere else. Uh, no, somewhere else. Somewhere else. Okay. Right. Um, uh, all right. Uh, all are very valid dancers, right? Let's also try to pick where, like, this is, I mean, like, from which country kind of this uh, photo might have like, uh, came from. Uh, one of the Arab countries. One of the Arab countries, and why so? Uh, judging by her dress and then by the date palm in the background. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Good observations, right? Okay, so uh, anybody else who want to contribute? Okay, I mean, it's it's really good. Like the, we, we kind of uh, had a lot of inputs to what we are seeing in this photo. So let me go one step further. In fact, you can see like this is coming from one social media site and you are seeing you have the photo here and you have a small comment or a description that comes uh, along with this photo. Now, what do you see here? What do we see here? Now, in, in Saudi Arabia, women are not legally allowed to drive. So she is trying to make a statement here by driving a car. Exactly. Anybody else? And maybe she is only the female uh, that uh, with the driving skill. Maybe because the rain begins with a single drop, it, single it drop. signifies something like that. Yeah, in fact, like if you can also focus on now, uh, uh, which year it is in 2017. So, right now, now what do you see? Now, initially, we were presented with a, pho a photograph, right? A, a picture taken by someone, and we try to illustrate, we try to interpret it. So, the thing is, like, we are just constrained with what we are seeing on this photograph. And we also have some background information with us, like the background, it, it may be like, say, for example, if I'm, uh, if, I, if, if by looking at it, I don't understand, if I don't uh, may, uh, able to make it out that this is from Arab country, it's, uh, I'm going to interpret it in a different way. 
because like that information is something that we are living with our living experience some um, uh, info, uh, some some experience that we have gathered from uh, 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 from our day to day life and news and things like that. So this is something which is very subjective. So that is why if we are if we just present someone a photograph or a picture, that person will try to interpret with the knowledge that he is having. And then sometimes, say for example, forgetting that uh, we had this description, that person will try to you know um, interpret it in his own way and try to comprehend. The idea that we are trying to uh, communicate through this photograph in a totally different way that he only understands. So this is when, like, uh, it is very important for us to have a description, uh, which is next to a kind of a photograph or maybe some uh, some. Um, I mean, it could be a photograph or even in our DHS to context context, it could be uh, any visualization like a map or table. To have some description so that uh, we we uh, inform the person who is uh, trying to interpret this visualization uh, some context like this is coming from this program this country right and th these may be the da contributing data elements right so that kind of idea this is why I'm uh, what I want to highlight that this is very important for us to give some background some description uh, just uh, uh, next to the visualization so that we can communicate the idea a bit. In addition, we also see uh, something else. Now, for example, we have this description here and we are seeing uh, these likes and comments. So this is this is from a social media site. And what uh, actually happens is when someone posts, uh, like this one posts, now this uh, lady posts something expressing her joy uh, regarding what has happened. And what people can do is they can engage. They can engage by sharing their emotions like, for example, uh, I mean, you can put a thumbs up or, or, or a heart uh, where, where you express that you like it. And sometimes you can come in. Like if uh, the comments could be like, sometimes they can, uh, the, the person who is looking uh, at this thing might uh, disagree or agree or may sometimes even add to what uh, she's trying to um, communicate here. So this is a nice example that we inherently have in social media about engaging with the end users. So what we actually should try to do now, uh, on a different note, DHS to itself is again a, a, a site uh, or a website or a platform where we try to share visualizations based on data that we have collected, right? So what we can actually do is rather than just displaying these visualizations in analytic tools or even dashboards, if we can put this kind of a description, right? That is number one, if we can put a description, what we can do is like we can give a better context uh, about uh, uh, from where this data coming to the end user. That is number one. And the second thing is if we can have these kind of uh, features that are there available in uh, social media sites for engaging, such as you know like putting likes um, and and commenting, right? Um, it could be really engaging. So basically, in DHIS two, uh, we from last I mean like like two to three years, we have both these I mean all. Uh, uh, all these features um, engage in the platform. So we have a feature called interpretation where we allow the users who are generating a favorite item or a visualization to put a description that is there. And now we also have the ability to put likes, comments, and even subscribe, like you subscribe to a YouTube, YouTube channel. So this is where we are trying to link the social interactions uh, into the DHS2 platform for engaging better and sharing information. I hope that is clear. Okay. Right. So let us now um, go back and uh, uh, try to apply this to a DHS2 um, uh, scenario. So uh, for example, we see here uh, DPT3 coverage by district, right? This is a map, right? And then we have here a graph. So basically now we have uh, uh, when we are trying to explain the context, we have to explain based on uh, several uh, dimensions, right? Sorry, uh, are you having any issues seeing my presentations? The, the no. no, right? Okay, fine. Yeah, because uh, I think someone is having problem. Or I just want to reassure. Fine. Okay, so one thing we can comment is what are we looking at, right? So that is one question. And then that that for that we have to provide sufficient information so that a user who is not too familiar if you can remember on the very first day, I showed you how to do a desk review using DHSU platform. 
So to do that, sometimes we may get a consultant from out, outside of the country, and that person may not be too much familiar with the, 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 maybe the data dictionary that is used in the country or even uh, the geographical distribution, things like that. So for that uh, scenario, it is very important that we provide some context about what that person is looking at. That is number one. And the ne next thing is, okay, now I can interpret what we see here. So what's next? Now, DHIS2 is just not totally a data repository, right? So we collect data, but now the, the end point is like, we should be able to make use of data. So whoever who's interpreting, maybe at the field level or district national level, they should know after looking at this, uh, in, uh, at this visualization, what are we supposed to do? Say, for example, if you are not happy with, now, now if we just uh, focus our attention here, if you are not uh, happy with the coverage of bird district, so what is next? Right? So what are we going to do next? So this is where the important concept of action comes to play. Right? So uh, to do that, what we have to do is, we have to have a good interpretation to provide a co uh, context for the visualization. And that interpretation at the end should carry some information about the action. Okay, now this is what you see. So if based on what you see in this visualization, if it criteria these uh, particular parameters, do this action. If it is not fulfilling the parameters, do something else. So this action component also needs to happen for us to have a, a better engagement um, and, and data use with the end users. Okay, so to do that, like there are so many ways of having these interpretations and designing what you are going to do with the data that, that or the visualizations that you see, right? So uh, the thing is like, what I want to highlight is in DHIS2, we recommend this, uh, this uh, framework called data to action framework, which mainly looks at five, five parameters when you are trying to uh, create a description or interpretation of a visualization. Uh, so I'm not saying this is the only framework that you can use. So if your country has your own framework of doing it based on uh, the expert opinion, or if you can adopt another better framework for uh, based on international um, expertise or uh, I mean like a similar scenario, you can do that. But this is one framework that uh, most of the countries tend to use because it covers most of the um, uh, aspects of uh, data sharing, engagement, and data use. So to do that, for a given visualization, to design a data to action framework, we use these five parameters in a DHIS2 platform. So the first thing that we have to talk about is the indicator, right? What is it about? What? What is the data that we are looking at? Then we talk about the visualization. What exactly are you looking at? And then what is the objective of having this visualization and the data source? And then what is the related action? So we will just go through one by one. The first thing is, what is the data? So basically, like this, the first parameter, what it means is, what is the data item that you are uh, using to generate the uh, visualization? So it could be like, you know very well, in uh, whatever that is coming in the what dimension of DHIS2, we can use. So uh, essentially, we can use uh, the, the data elements or indicators. But usually, uh, we, we prefer indicators as opposed to data elements. But I'm not saying data elements are not, uh, are not you know, like of any value. So what is the reason why we usually prefer indicators in, 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 in generic dashboards? What do you think is the reason? A question for all of you? Indicator basically measures the performance uh, by indicator we can measure the performance uh, can measure the performance right but even data elements someone can argue you can use a data element to us uh, uh, to uh, to like you know like uh, assess the performance of a particular district i i think with indicator uh, we can compare uh, with each other exactly the organization unit yeah, that, that's why I mentioned like, so for example, if you're just looking at one org unit or one area, maybe data element makes sense. Or even like, say for example, in, in, in most of the COVID-19 dashboards, 
we look at um, a country level, say like uh, the, the uh, uh, cases confirmed, right? That's a, just a raw data element. So that makes sense and it's a very important um, parameter. But the thing is, when we are looking at, uh, uh, at a particular performance indicator at national level, we, what we are actually trying to do is we try to compare the different districts. So for us to do a comparison, we definitely needs to you know, like bring everything into one common baseline. So to do that, we have to use a denominator. So when you use a denominator, it invariably becomes an indicator. And that's why indicators are very commonly practiced in these uh, interpretations and dashboards. But I'm not saying uh, you can't use data elements. So there are examples of using data elements as well. So that's the first parameter. Uh, the second one is the visualization. So what we mean by the visualization is like how we present our data, right? So for example, in DHS2, there are different types of visualizations that you have learned uh, during this academic, right? We can use a table, we can use a chart, we can use a map, right? So there are different types of visualization. So for each context, we can't say which visualization is better. So that totally depends on um, what you are trying to do. So if you can remember, like while, while I was doing the charts uh, uh, session, I uh, continuously said, it's all up to you. We can't say this one is the perfect, right? We, can, we, we may be able to say like this one suits better, but then you may have a compelling reason to use something else. So similarly, this is about what type of visualization we are going to use. The next thing is about the objective of having a visualization, right? So the thing is now, uh, but what usually happens in, in, um, in most of the countries when we talk about paper-based uh, data collection is like uh, we become very over ambitious, like uh, people who design these data collection forms at national level, and we try to include everything. But like, uh, that, I, that in fact is a wrong practice because like uh, the, if you are just trying to uh, go in that direction, what I mean by that direction is you start with the data collection form. So first we think like what are the parameters that we need to um, collect from say at field level and we, you know, like list them out and we make the data collection form. Fine. And the, then we send these paper forms to the field level and we uh, receive the uh, completed forms uh, from the lower level maybe up to district or national level. And then what we are going to do, we are then think, thinking of how to analyze and make some use out of this data. So then we realize that sometimes most, I mean, most of the time, um, a significant proportion of data items or elements that we have included in the paper form, we are not going to analyze. We can't in fact analyze, right? Sometimes we have not um, ordered them properly. So this, this data is not, I mean, we cannot analyze and sometimes, um, just analyzing doesn't make sense. But like, have you ever thought about what, what kind of a crime we did? Each data item, we try to incorporate into the data, uh, data forms. Like one thing is we are consuming printing costs, right? Paper forms are going to get longer and somebody has to use their valuable time to collect that information. Sometimes they are not even uh, available, right? And then ultimately we are not make, going to make any uh, use of data. So this is why you have to always think like, is there any objective in trying to make this interpretation, right? So this is why this third parameter becomes very important. Uh, so when we try to uh, incorporate this parameter into any visualization, we always think, okay, I mean, do we really need to collect this data item? Or does it make any sense? If not, we just need, don't need to collect, right? So simple as that. So, and then again, uh, this even, um, you know, like make things more cleaner so that, you know, like you don't try to flood the user with multiple visualizations in a given dashboard. We only have the ones which are very necessary for someone to make some uh, proper interpretation. So that's why we have this one called uh, objective of the visualization, why it is important to have this particular visualization. Right. Then something very important to uh, mention, what is the data source? So for example, the data source could be multiple. Sometimes uh, in a case of an indicator, the data source may be coming from multiple data sets or data entry forms, right? Numerator may be coming from one form and the denominator from another. So this is when, if you don't mention that one in a visualization, what usually happens is people are lazy, right? So you have to keep that in mind. Whoever who's seen this visualization, 
we can assume that they are lazy and they are not going to you know uh, drill down maybe open um, uh, a main and, and the other problem is sometimes they may not have access to uh, to the maintenance uh, module in the dhs2 for them to see what is the data source so that way uh, we can make their life very difficult by uh, not sharing the data source so it really makes sense for someone to get a complete idea uh, of the uh, interpretation that we are trying to give by having the data source list so here in an example of an indicator you can mention um, the, now here the numerator the bcg dose is given and the denominator number of live births and finally, the most important thing, what is the action? You can remember this framework is about data to action. So we have collected data. We have structured them nicely so that someone make a, can make a very good interpretation of what we are seeing. But what do you have to do based on the data? So here, uh, if we try to concentrate on what is mentioned. So for example, we tell them what to do for each of the uh, outputs. So we now, for example, most of these visualizations uh, if they are charts or maps, they tend to have legends, right? So they give an idea about if this is red color, what does it highlight? So here it says if the BCG coverage is, coverage is purple, which is like more, uh, equal or more than 125%, then it says, please review the numerator. Are there any entries, uh, errors, or are there any outliers, right? And also it could be uh, due to a problem in denominator, right? Because I mean, the value can go up based on an uh, issue with the numerator or the denominator. So if it is the denominator, is the target population plausible? Maybe the target population is too less. That is why we are seeing 125%. So always check whether uh, this is something that could happen. Okay, And then if it is green, like more than or equal to 90%, then we ask them sustain the effort. Okay, you are doing good, but keep it up, right? I mean, sometimes what, what happens is most of the time, uh, if things are fine, we don't come in, right? But but it really matters, you know, like even for the end users to motivate them. If you are good, you just have to, you know, like uh, accept that they are doing good and appreciate what they are doing. So basically, you, we have a criteria here. If it is uh, over 95, 90%, keep it up. Then if it is less than 90%, what could happen and what they have to do? Something very generic. So it, it all depends on... Um, like your country context and the uh, target audience that you are looking at. Say, for example, here, some uh, what they have mentioned is we can check whether there is under under reporting, why it is less than 90%, or whether the staff have conducted educational awareness program in the community, right, for them to you know, receive the uh, vaccines, or uh, whether there are adverse effects following immunization in the community. Uh, so, uh, but again, we have to mention, like, sometimes, um, we don't tend to, when we are presenting, we, we, we go with these abbreviations like BCG, AEFI. In case if you are not familiar with these uh, abbreviations, um, uh, please always uh, feel free to ask in Slack or chat. Uh, we can definitely answer. But like we just go with, because like we, we assume that most of uh, the, the participants here are somewhat familiar with uh, the health related uh, terms that we are using, but, uh, uh, but, uh, at any, any point of time, if you are not familiar, please let us know. We will definitely um, explain what these, uh, what these terms mean. And then uh, whether the cold chain is working fine. So cold chain is something to do with vaccines. I'm, I'm not going, into, going to mention what it is. And whether uh, significant periods of stockouts have been there. So now you understand, right? I mean, just looking at this D2A, the data to action framework, if you are just an IT person, Without having any any health knowledge, you may be not able to you know like design this data action frame. And also, if you are just a public health um, um, physician or a public health person who doesn't know how these uh, uh, parameters have been configured uh, in DHIS2, then also you might struggle. So this is where you have to understand. Sometimes configuring this uh, data action framework is always going to be a group exercise with uh, inputs from many. Okay. Fine. Um, so what we do finally after uh, you know creating this framework is to put it in DHS2. So it is very simple. Now you have uh, you all know how to save a favorite item, right? So after uh, designing uh, the favorite item, it could be a chart or a map, uh, you click on save as, right? So that that is where you have to give a name and a, a description details, right? 
So what you can do is in details tab, you have to make uh, mention um, the data to action framework like this. Okay. So it's basically is a summary of these five parameters that we discussed so far. So you initially mentioned about indicator, the visualization is anywhere there, the objective, data source, and action that follows. Only four of those, right? You don't mention the visualization because it's already, already there uh, displayed here. And also keep in mind when you are typing this visualization in DHS2, DHS2 support rich text um, uh, uh, for, for you to make uh, this text appear in bold and italics. So um, I, when I'm doing the demonstration, I will show you an example on how to type this uh, so that you can uh, format it better, okay? Right, okay. So the thing is, uh, now what you are seeing here um, is a theoretical framework for data-driven decision-making, uh, which has been uh, presented at another uh, major forum, right? So what we try to highlight here is, uh, Inherently, DHIS2 is a data repository, right? Where we are collecting data. So that is there, uh, no problem about it. And in DHIS2, rather than collecting data, we try to make the data meaningful by, you know, like presenting and combining it with uh, uh, another denominator so that you can make the indicator, so you can get some information out of it. But to, uh, to turn data into information, and then the most important thing is to turn it into knowledge and action. So to do this knowledge and action, that is where some in insight has to come from, uh, uh, from the context and the public health the knowledge that you have. So that's what we are trying to achieve by having this uh, data to action framework. So when we try to do that, uh, sometimes you may ask like at which level we are targeting. So my answer for that would be like, it has to be all the levels. Sometimes you can decide um, like uh, you can have some certain visualizations on which may be only applicable to uh, like provincial level, right? Because these, I mean, you may not really be able to make uh, uh, much sense at the field level, but uh, always remember you, it's, it is compulsory and it is really important for you to have some dashboards for the lowest level users as well, because like we don't just, uh, you know, expect to, have data use applied only at provincial or district. So it has to be applied at all levels, starting from the lowest most level. So please keep that in mind when you're creating these visualizations about the end users. So that final objective is to um, that not only to collect data, but to make it, uh, turn it into useful information and knowledge, which can be used for public health action. So that's the objective uh, of uh, what we are trying to do. So when can we take, um, take this approach? At any time, right? It doesn't have to be like um, only after, you know, like uh, say like after one year of implementation. No, not like that, at any time. And every time when you are creating a DHS2 visualization. So again, we are, because we are lazy, we just try to put a name and save the visualization. But if you can actually, at least uh, when you are trying to do it in the production instance, if you can try to put some description, a detail, based on the data direction framework, it really makes sense. And every time you try to comment in a DHS to visualization, um, ask the owner, right? Um, who uploaded, uh, I mean, like who created this visualization, please upload the data direction framework. Um, uh, if, if it is already not there in the visualization, he may. And maybe like, because it's a, like people might feel it's a bit difficult at first, but if you really get used to it, you will, you will see like how few, um, visualizations you actually need to have in your dashboards. If you are not sure what you are trying to show, then only you will try to put too many um, stuff into the dashboard so that it, it may not make proper sense. All right, so that's it about data direction framework. And next I will just try to demonstrate how to do this in DHS2 uh, instance. Any questions up to this point? Right, if there are no questions, let me. Uh, uh, my comment is um, please provide um, case study 
in real practice um, on the uh, data visualize and take action how to take it and how to translate um, that visualize to make an, uh, the action. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, uh, in fact, like that's what we are trying to do next, rather than uh, me trying to find a uh, uh, just just present a case and try to apply it to data action framework. What we will try to do it is we will put it in a group context so that um, uh, so that uh, there will be inputs from multiple people, and then we will discuss one by one so that we can have a much better engagement. We'll do like that so that we can uh, uh, also save time. Is that fine? Thank you. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, how many? So we have, yeah, 30 participants. Um, uh, Paul Maud? Yeah. I would like to know if uh, there is any standard indicator uh, to say that, like, for instance, here we said BCD coverage is good if it is like 100 more, like if it is 100%. Is there any standard uh, format or any indicator checklist? Okay, uh, good question. Um, I guess even uh, if, if you have participants uh, who are representing uh, like uh, development partners, they can also come in. So it's like this. So there are some like now in DHS2 is used uh, across multiple um, programs. So there are some uh, standard guidelines based on international recommendations from WHO, UNICEF and uh, similar organizations on uh, uh, what would be the standard values, cutoff val values. But in most cases, countries go by their own indicators, right? Because we can't just say 90% is a good one because usually it is totally dependent on the national program in the Ministry of Health. Say, for example, National Immunization Program. Because the thing is this, right? Now you are comparing across countries. So like uh, some countries are developing countries who are really having a lot of uh, um, non -communic I mean, communicable diseases and um, I mean, the, like, which you try to address through vaccination programs. So if that is a con uh, scenario, then they may like think, okay, the good values must be values which are much, much less, right? So that way it is, um, it is totally up to the countries. But for some, there are some generally accepted uh, indicators. Uh, anybody else who want to comment, uh, Saurabh, or any, any other participant who's like a public health expert on this, but uh, this is what, what I generally understand. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so let's now focus on the demonstration. Let me share my screen again. Right, so, okay. Now I have logged into the DHIS2 instance um, as a national user, right? And I'm, I'm able to see many dashboards. Uh, so I'm going to focus on this particular dashboard here called HIV National, right? So in this HIV National program, I see multiple uh, items displayed, right? And I'm going to specifically focus on this particular visualization here, this map, which is on HIV ART retention last 12 months, right? So if I just display the legend here, we can see um, like if it is more than 90%, that is when they consider as satisfactory, anything below that are not good. And if it is on red color, then that, that is not good at all. So the thing is like, if I just uh, have a look at uh, the existing data, we can see uh, the sweet and desert district are the ones that are having satisfactory um, retention, HIV, ART retention rates, but all others are having some issues. <clears throat> so uh, what I try to do next is, I just try to click on this uh, button here and it has something called show interpretation and details. Right, okay. Now, what I, what I can see is, the name is here for this visualization, but I don't see any description um, on what to do or how to interpret this data, which is not good, right? So what I can do is I can uh, open this visualization and try to put a data to action frame, okay? So let me open this uh, by clicking on open in maps application, right? And here, what we can do is, uh, we see this uh, 
yeah now here what we see actually is the uh, the general map visualization okay and uh, we need to add a uh, interpretation okay right. so what we do is we click on file and rename okay here we are seeing the name of the visualization but the description is not there so to save time i have already um, prepared a description which i am going to copy paste here okay all right before doing that let me show uh, show it in notepad so that um, you be you will be able to understand how how we do this You can see the visualization, uh, I mean, the interpretation that I'm going to create. So we have um, this called, uh, now here, if you can remember, we have four major topics. One is the indicator, then the objective, data source, and action to follow. So here we talk about, for example, ART retention rate after 12 months. That's the indicator. And then the objective, we can uh, specify, like to track the percentage of uh, pat uh, patients retaining on ART after 12 months of initiation of treatment. And then we are mentioning about the data source from where this indicator, uh, the data to this indicator is coming from, right? So here we can mention, we have mentioned the numerator, denominator. And also if you can, if you think uh, mentioning the data set is better, please do that. Right? You can also mention which data set uh, uh, this indicator is contributed from. So that's, uh, that's about the data source and then the action to follow. So in this one, uh, you can like, for example, what is different from this one and the actions that I mentioned to you in the pre previous example is here, we only comment on what to do if it is more than 90% and what to do if it is less, right? But if um, you, it really makes sense, if you really want, you can put uh, what to do if it is more than 100 and like, say, for example, if it is more than 100%, what to do? That also has to be um, um, that you can include, okay? Right. Um, Right, and then another thing I wanted to mention is um, the, uh, the the characters that we have, the asterisks and the underscores. So basically, uh, we are we are using something called markdown or rich text in DHS two visualizations. So when you are using rich text, or what you can do is you can uh, Google um, uh, something called markdown, right? So markdown, this is what. So this is what we use uh, when we are writing uh, the descriptions in DHIS2. So what, 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 what do we mean by markdown? It's like, uh, now this is a plain text that we are seeing, right? We don't see any, um, uh, whether it is bold or italic, we don't see. But like, if we want to make the uh, text bold or italics, right? When it appears in the DHIS2 in the visualize, in the interpretation, we can use characters like this. So I'm not going into too much of information on how to use this, you can always Google. So for, uh, for all purposes, for this uh, during this session, you can uh, uh, remember that uh, if you use this asterisk mark uh, at the beginning and end, this is the opening asterisk and this is the closing one. Uh, the text that is between these uh, two asterisk marks is going to get uh, turned into ball, right? Similarly, if it is between the underscores, uh, this is going to turn into uh, italics, okay? So that's how it works. And here we have again bold, and this is italics, okay? So to, to see whether this works, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put it in the description. Right, so I just copy paste it here, right? And it is all saved. And then I click on rename, right? Fine, I hope it got saved. Let me click on interpretations now. This tab, and now you can see the text that we uh, saved just now is uh, is nicely displayed here under the interpretation tab. Okay, so we have uh, the map details, the ind indicator is there, objective, data source, and action that follows in uh, bold, and then the subsections. Those are there in um, in italics. Okay, right. So hope you can interpret it that. Uh, any questions up to this point? So what we what we have done is like now I of course uh, I edited an existing um, item favorite item. But what you can actually do when you are like uh, creating a new visualization is when you are going to save it, right? At that point you can mention this data to action framework in the description. 
And when you do that, uh, in the visualization here, when you click on the interpretation step, it appears right here. Okay. Hope that is clear. Okay. Right. So let me do something. What I can do is I can try to log in from another user's account. Okay. Just give me a second. Sharing again. Okay. Right. So this is another user, uh, a separate user for the academy. So I just tried to load, uh, refresh the dashboard, the same dashboard, HIV national dashboard, and I scroll all the way down. Right. And here I'm seeing uh, the HIV ART retention rate. So I try to click on show interpretations and details. And here now I'm seeing that uh, the interpretations has properly got, uh, the, the description has got updated properly and it is available to all the users. Okay, right. So here you see a uh, few, few things. First, uh, first thing that you see here, see here is you can um, make a comment to the interpretation here. And also you see a bell icon here, which is a subscribe button. So let me try to click on subscribe button here, right? And now I'm subscribed. And what I will try to do is, I will go back and log in again with the previous user here. And then I will go to the dashboard again, right? So that uh, see whether I also see the same visualization, I should be able to see, right? And here I can mention, I can uh, either, uh, as you can remember, I showed you, I can um, type it at mark so that it will list out all the users uh, who are there, right? So if you, if I want to specifically um, address to one, one, one user, I can use it like, I, I can type it like that. Say for example, if I want the attention of admin user, I can um, type something like, please see this, for example, right? Or else, what I can do is I can make a generic comment. Say for example, all uh, district managers, please ensure that you have reviewed ART retention rates. I will just mention it and I will click on save interpretation. Okay. So that's what I did. And now let me try to log back uh, in using the previous user. I hope I'm all right. Let's see. And I tried to refresh the screen. Right. And look what happened. So here I am seeing now previously this interpretation, this, this button here, it was blank. And now I'm seeing it shows one notification, right? So that means there is one notification available for this user. So let me try to click on it and see what happens, right? All right. So here I'm seeing all the notifications which are available for this user. And you see, why I got this notification here? Because I have subscribed to this particular favorite item, and because the uh, the, the the one person made some comment, which was the district managers, please ensure that you have reviewed ART retention rates. I'm getting this alert uh, so that I don't miss this. So or every time uh, when 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 there's a um, when there's an activity or engagement to an already subscribed item, there is an alert that is coming in the interpretations part, right? so that I don't miss it. So similarly, now what I can do is I can comment uh, uh, on, on, on here or else I can go here and even from the dashboard, I can comment on this interpretation, right? So what I can do is I can click reply, right? So that it goes under the main thread, noted, till review, right? And then click on save. So it is nicely displayed here as a thread, right? 
Is that clear? Right. So I hope that makes sense. And again, let me try to open this um, in the maps application, this visualization, right? And try to show you how this interpretation or the description and the comments that the person has made appears in this interpretations panel. So I click, click here. For some reason here, it has not got updated. I will have to check on that. But what I wanted to uh, highlight here is, here you see uh, the subscribe button, right? So because I'm already subscribed here, I can click on this button to unsubscribe from this interpretation, right? And then I should be ideally seeing all the comments made under this interpretation um, or as a description uh, as a thread below. And in this, I'm able to see few engagement buttons, right? I can see like, I can see reply, I can see share, edit, and delete if I have the proper uh, access controls to do these uh, particular activities. Now here I'm seeing the view button and look what happened, right? Uh, the noted thing, I mean, my other comment is there now. So look what happens uh, when I click on this exit and um, view, right? When I click on view button, you will see the same visualization and it will mention viewing interpretation from 26th May, right? What actually happens here is what uh, basically like the problem that we can encounter is um, now when we, you know, like because so many people will be commenting and, uh, you know, uh, interpreting what they see and maybe uh, a comment I have made here three days back, it may not properly reflect what was actually there in the visualization three days back. So that's the, that's the thing that we are trying to address here because now this is a kind of a living dashboard and data can get uh, you know populated and uh, based on that the visualization can get updated and if you like uh, try to see a, a comment that is made by someone about uh, three four days back uh, maybe the visualization that loads by default may not make proper sense so that's why you can click on this view button here so that it will try to highlight uh, what was there in the visualization at the point of time that person tried to make that comment is that clear so that's what this uh, view button does so that you go back in time and try to see to what context this person has made this comment. Okay. Right. So I guess that is all I have to cover mainly in the interpretations. So what I actually did uh, in this demonstration is uh, I showed you how to open an existing uh, favorite item, right? You can just uh, open it here. And if that favorite item is lacking uh, interpretation, what you can do is you can click on this rename button because we try to modify existing one, okay? And we want the same one to appear in the dashboard as well. Or else you can click on save as, but then what happens is it will create a new favorite item and you may have to add that item again into the dashboard because it's a new one. So to uh, change the existing one, what we'll do is we will save it here, okay? And uh, we put a description based on the data to action framework. And I also showed you, like you can use this markdown characters to make it italics and bold, right? And then I also showed you what is this interpretation panel, what it has. So it has the description and it has the subscribe button and it will also have the comments made by um, the end users. And I mentioned to you, what are these, uh, each of these ones are doing? And also specifically about this view button, uh, which shows that, uh, which will highlight, which will bring bring up uh, the visualization uh, uh, that was uh, shown at the time the person made the comment, right? And also I highlighted to you that uh, there is this um, uh, the, the, the sub uh, interpretations button uh, in which we will get notifications every time somebody makes an engagement. And also, all oh right, yeah, I can also show this. Now, for example, this is my email account of this particular user and I see like uh, every time uh, when someone makes a count, uh, makes a comment to a uh, item that I have sub subscribed, I will see some, uh, I will be getting notification alert from me through email as well. That of course you will have to configure, right? So you have to configure your, uh, your DHS2 instance uh, with the mail, uh, you know, with the mail server credentials, number one, and you have to have uh, uh, the email account set up for that particular user. 
and you have to also number three is you have to enable uh, the permission or the from the user side to receive notifications through email. Right? Once these three criteria are fulfilled, you will get email alerts as well. So I assume that's all what we have to discuss about uh, data action framework and interpretations. So what we can do next is a group activity where I think uh, you must be seeing it in the uh, uh, in the edX. Uh, what you have to do. So what we expect to do uh, in simple terms is to produce uh, a one slide presentation, PowerPoint presentation, which have those five columns, which I highlighted in the data to action framework. So uh, let me share. So, Basically, what we have to do is something like this. Okay. So we are, I just want you to do something like this. Okay. Create something like um, let's make it larger. Yeah. Let me share again. Okay, the activity is this, and uh, mind you, this will be a group activity. So you, uh, we will open uh, Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, once we do that, how many participants? Uh, so how are we going to do this, Saurabh? Uh, we have 35. So how many we need? Uh, how about we, yeah, we will have maybe six groups so that uh, otherwise it will be too many because we need to uh, spend time on discussing as well. So we will make six groups. So once we do that, you will be randomly allocated to one of the groups, breakout rooms. So in that room, what you have to do is you have to discuss amongst participants. So please listen carefully what you have to do. So say, supposing like, because we have around 35 people, we may have around five to six people per group. So what you have to do is go through your DHIS2 instance, that is number one, and find a visualization, existing visualization, uh, uh, to which you can create this data to action framework, right? So it could be any, any, anything, right? So for example, it could be, uh, don't use the ones, the examples that we have already discussed, such as the, uh, the BCG coverage and the ART, um, uh, ART retention. So other than BCG coverage and ART retention, uh, select any uh, visualization. But the only issue is we, we, we don't want all of you to discuss about the same visualization, which is there, right? So please let us know in advance in Slack, uh, uh, we will make uh, the groups as one, two, three, four, five, six. So each group, please let us know in advance, what is the particular visualization? Like what is the indicator name that you are selecting, right? So that uh, we, we can, I mean, so it's, a, it's totally first come first serve basis. Like if you select it first uh, and, and announce it in the, um, in the Slack, then another group will not be able to take it, okay? So uh, let us know what is the indicator or the visualization that you select. That is number one, right? So in, uh, within the group, decide uh, what to include for this slide, right? I mean, for each of the column, what you are going to include. So for example, here the name is kind of straightforward, the visualization, right? So in fact, uh, even though we just asked you to use the existing visualization, you can comment. This is the visualization which is there at the moment, but we would prefer to have not this, Maybe something else you can even maybe even create like say for example you think map is not ideal but uh, it should be a chart you can put a chart here saying this is what we have here but we can put something else right and then uh, write the objective the data source and the data uh, the related actions right so this in fact like especially uh, completing these three columns you will have to discuss uh, amongst the group uh, and do it. And what we uh, ideally want, uh, so we will give you around 20 minutes. Is that enough, Saurabh? What do you think? 20 minutes? Uh, promote uh, example yeah. like that as well, so how we can find it and... Uh, how, how to, yeah, it's there under exercises in uh, edX. Um, uh, let, let me get back to that shortly. Uh, but like, I just wanted to um, uh, explain the procedure. So. Uh, what we want to do is like, once you make this slide in PowerPoint, we want one person of each group to make a, like a brief two minutes. So maybe maximum three minutes, take three minutes and explain to entire audience, to all of us, 
uh, how you interpreted this, what is there in each of the columns, and um, uh, just make a brief interpretation and then everyone can come. In. Right. So, um, uh, going back to your question, uh, it should be uh, the exercise should be available in the uh, edX. So, let me pull it up. So uh, in the data to action framework, um, today's exercise, there is an option called exercise download, right? So when you click on exercise download, uh, it should download a presentation, a blank presentation, which is something like this. Let me share my screen. Something like this should be there, okay? So what you have to do is, you can refer this one. Um, I mean, this is just for your reference, right? And you can use uh, the, the slide number three to complete uh, uh, this slide based on the visualization that you select, okay? And uh, what you actually have to do is to present this slide number three, okay? Is that clear? Any questions? Right, so if there are no questions, uh, Saurabh, are you ready for uh, to create the breakout rooms? Any mention to the participants before? Any instructions? Yeah, I'm just adding all to the groups. Right, okay. Uh, so how many groups do we have? Six, right? Six of six, them? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. So uh, once Saurabh opens the, uh, the, the, the six rooms, the breakout rooms, you all will end up in the breakout rooms, right? Um, and then what you have to do is within the group, please select one visualization. And as soon as you select it, uh, please announce us uh, what you selected in uh, which channel. You can announce it in uh, assignments channel, right? In the assignments channel in Slack, please let us know. Uh, I'm group number one, we selected this, right? So that way everyone can see uh, uh, the, the topic, the, the visualizations we have already selected. And then in the groups, discuss how to complete this related to action framework and complete that slide and maybe get ready in like 20 minutes so that we will discuss one by one. Is that okay? So when Saurabh is ready, we can start the breakout rooms and then um, yeah, we will discuss about it. You're ready, Saurabh? Okay, right. So uh, see you in 20 minutes.